Father, we thank you. We give you praise for today. We pray that even as we've come before you, pray that you help us open the eyes of our understanding. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. We thank God for today. Uh, last week, we ended the first session. We ended the first session, and today we are starting the second session of the course, which is Leaders and Personal Development. Leaders and personal development that is the 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 session that we've started today but today we are looking at knowing who you are knowing who you are so it's important to uh, have a fair idea of who you are um when i say who you are i'm talking about many things um your personality your function your predispositions um predilections your strengths your weaknesses and all so when you know who you are, it will help you to be able to focus your energies on your strength and manage your areas of limitation. Because every human being has limitations, uh, personality differences, um, and, and many other things. So, as soon as you get in tune with how you have been wired, automatically certain principles will start applying to you and automatically you, you also start um, acknowledging certain principles. Uh, you know, for instance, if you know yourself you are salt for instance if you are salt you know your nature as salt it becomes a law for you not to stay out in the rain nobody will have to make that law for you your nature by default you shouldn't stay in the rain because you are salt Let's read Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 29. Let's look at a scripture there. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 29. Okay. It says, Truly, this only I have found, that God made man upright, but they have sought out many schemes. God made man upright, but they have sought out many schemes. What he's trying to say is that as far as God is concerned, he made man perfect, you know, but there are many things that are of our making. And so if you look at who you are right now, you understand that you are, I mean, look at who man is right now, you understand that um the way god created man and the way man is now the way man is now is a far cry from the way god created man man has become very complicated and sophisticated but god created man very well you know bible says uprightly but we have sought out many many inventions many schemes now, in seeking to know who we are, we must be guided by certain truth. We must be guided by certain truth. 
And uh, one of the very first things we must understand is the difference between nature and what we call nature. So nature and nature. Nature, N-A-T-U-R-E, and then nature, N-U-T-U-R-E. The two are not the same, and uh, their meanings are, are far apart. So uh, nature is talking about the things that God gave us, how God made us. You know, we all know when we say something is natural, it means it is God-given. It was created by God. And uh, every human being was packaged in a unique way and dispatched into this earth by God. That is nature or natural. There's a natural packaging of everybody. And so that is, and you know, because God is never short of ideas, you will see that naturally, human beings are different, very, very different. Uh, you can have people, we can have twins, and then they will still be different. As a matter of fact, science has um, helped us to understand that there are no two people with the same thumbprint, the same thumbprint or fingerprints. It's not, it's, I mean, it's, it's a fact. And that is to that is to let us know that number one, God never runs out of ideas, and that number two, every human being is unique. Same way, you don't have the same fingerprints as the other person. Uh, it's the same way you are also unique and different from the other person, and everybody. Is also a unique blend of many things. A unique blend of many things. Naturally speaking. Naturally speaking. Okay. So, so you can write nature on one side and then nature on another side. Nature on one side. Nature on another side. And under nature, under nature, you can write personality, personality, and into brackets, personality into brackets, natural bent, natural bent towards a particular emotional disposition. That's your personality, your natural bent or tilt towards a particular emotional disposition now if personality is natural it is god-given okay attitude is not it's not natural personality is natural okay then number two abilities abilities also fall under nature and into brackets you can write what you are able to do naturally what you are able to do naturally, your abilities. They are also part of nature. They, they, they fall under nature. Then the third one is your heart. Your heart. Now, heart into brackets. Passions and desires. Passions and desires. Those things are also part of your nature. Everybody has passions. And passions are as different as thumbprints. They are, they are as different as human beings. You know. Then the fourth thing under nature is destiny ordination. Destiny ordination. And and uh, destiny ordination into bracket, write what you have been called to do. What you have been called to do. So destiny ordination, then what you have been called to do. Or you can also slash your assignment, your purpose. That is destiny ordination. All these things 
uh, they, they make up your nature. Your nature. Okay. Now, then we come to nature. N U R T U R E. Nature. And nature speaks of how we have been affected by our environment. How we have been affected by our environment. So nature is talking about the impact of our environment on, on us, on our uh, God-given personality, abilities, hearts, and destiny ordinations. Our thinking, uh, human beings are largely a product of their thinking. Everybody, the Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So, your thinking, you see, how, how you see things, how you see things, uh, it's because of who you are, who you are, or who you have become. So, at every material moment, your perspective, your perspective is a function of uh, your your disposition and your perspective they are a function of who you are or who you have become let me put it that way because our thinking is also a function of our environment the way we think can be affected by the environment the environment that has shaped our minds so you can think in a particular way because of the environment that has shaped your mind. Now, your environment is the things you interact with through your five senses. Those things constitute your environment. The things you see, the things you hear, the things you feel, the things you taste, the things you smell. Yes, so five. The five senses, the, the things you interact with through your five senses, those things constitute your environment. And those things are mind shapers, mind shapers, especially when you are young, those things shape your mind, shape your mind. If you take two children and you put one you put the two of them in different environments. Chances are that they will think differently. And their perspective of life will be affected by the environment. You can, you can put two people who are children. I can put one in a culture that respects uh, the dignity of human life and put another in a culture that does not respect human life, and you will see that they become products, all things being equal, they become products of the culture or the environment that you put them in. One Catholic priest said something. He said that, um, give me a child of three years. Come and take him away when he's 10 years. And I can promise you that all things being equal, he will be a Catholic forever. He said, give me a child of three years. Come back for the child when he's 10 years. And he will be a Catholic forever. All things being equal. Why? Environment. Because the environment is the mind shaper. It's the character shaper. Uh, is what attempts to shape even your personality. Your environment. Now, so nature... Nature is composed of five things. Nature is composed of um, five things. Okay, say six things, actually. All right. The first one is association. So now I'm defining your environment. I'm defining nature. What constitutes nature? I've defined what I've I've enumerated what constitutes nature. And I'm going to enumerate what constitutes nature. The first one is association. 
your association into brackets, you can write family, friends, loved ones, your association. Association is relationships. They, that's the first thing under nature. Okay, so your family, your friends, and the people you interact with, your loved ones, they form your association. And it's one pillar of your environment. So when I talk about your environment, these are the five pillars of your environment. Second pillar is traditions. Traditions. Now, traditions, uh, by traditions, I'm talking about, so into brackets, into brackets, I'm talking about practices. Practices. Okay. Practices. Then, methodology. Methodology. Okay, that's tradition. And then routine. Routine. So, traditions, I'm talking about practices. So, you'll see that the reason why the Catholic priest said that the child will be a Catholic forever, one of the reasons is these, these five things. Because association is uh, one, then tradition that the child is exposed to. In First Peter 1, 18, Bible talks about traditions that we receive from the fathers. Okay, it says, um, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from the aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers. He said the aimless conduct was received by tradition, which means it was received through the practices. They teaching us or we looking at the things that they used to do, you know, their routine, their methods, their way of doing things. Those We inherit those things. Uh, you know, um, Isaac and Abraham, you look at their lives and you will see that maybe Abraham intentionally taught Isaac to raise altars. But even if he had not taught him to raise altars, Isaac would have raised altars just by observing his father Abraham. So that is what traditions can do. So the, the, the Abraham is in the habit of raising altars. And then he will see that his father is putting, he's building an altar, putting stones together, he's, he's slaughtering an animal, he's burning the animal. And he's, he's talking to somebody who he says is God. So all things being equal, that Isaac is going to uh, borrow his way of doing things from tradition. Then the third thing that is part of our nature or environment is education. Education. And education, into brackets, right? Observation. Right? Observation. Then information, information, and then formal training. So when we have formal education and informal education, so your education also plays a vital role in your nurturing, in how you turn out. And uh, by education, I'm talking about how your mind, how your mind was uh, fed how your mind was fed, either through observation, uh, through information. Now, if you are exposed to, let's say, the radio, the radio, you will see that there's a certain kind of, um, there's a certain way that the radio disseminates information, or the certain way that they pass on information. Okay, if you're a child, and uh, you were you were raised by TV and radio, you, chances are that you, you will start thinking along a particular direction. Because number one, not all that they show on TV and radio is true. As a matter of fact, many of them are lies. Many of them are not real. Many of them are staged. Many of, many of them are made up. You know, so... Um, if if you 
who have received all your information through radio and TV, chances are that you are going to end up living a lie. And um, the lie is going to make you frustrated because the things you see, the way you see how that somebody can jump from a three-story building, and then you think that human beings, every everybody can do that, you know, and so you, you also jump. Then reality will cut you down to size. And then you realize that the one who jumped from the three-story building, it was a camera effect. It wasn't real. Okay, so uh, information. So how you go to information and then the source of your information, they shape your mind, especially when you are young. And not only when you are young, even as adults, as adults, we can decide to allow the, the uh, wrong sources of information to shape our thinking. It's not only children. Even adults are influenced by wrong sources of information. Why do we have fears? Why do we have anxieties? You see, it's because of the information that we choose to believe and we choose to live by. And the things that appear so real to us, you know, so if you are you are living your life, for instance, and you are responding to life's issues based on African movie and um, uh, the, uh, the, the information they release, you will see that your life is going to be a reflection of that, and you are going to be limited by what they show on Afri and in African movies. You are going to be superstitious. You are going to be afraid. You are going to be paranoid. You see, you are going to be depressed. It will always look as if the devil is waiting. Fear will grip you. You know. Then the fourth, the third thing, the fourth thing is events and circumstances. So under nature, nature, you see events and circumstances. They can affect your life. That's that's not nature. That is nature. So nature is intact. Nature is intact. But nature, under nature, events and circumstances can affect your life. And into brackets, right? Experience. Experience. Or experiences. And then experiments experiments all those things are part of nature part of that, your environment things that will shape your life and affect your life your experiences um when when you were a child your right brain is more active than your left brain your right brain is the one that is responsible for creativity that, that, can, that can believe all things, that can see all things. That's your right brain. So when you tell a child that I will buy you an airplane, the child has no reason to doubt. You know, the right brain, as far as it's concerned, the right brain will only imagine. That's where our creativity comes from, our imaginations. That's where they come from. Now, your left brain... That's where reality, reality emanates from. So your right brain can say that I am going to get an aeroplane. But if your left brain starts talking, your left brain will begin to uh, connect the dots for you, for you to know that you don't just buy an aeroplane. You need to have money. And not, that's not, not only money. But many other things, many other factors must be taken into consideration. So if you're a child, your right brain is more active. As you grow, then your left brain kicks in. And it's also, it, it, it checks the information that you, you've come to accept through your right brain. And that is why, you see, uh, if you look at the, the, by how God wants us to live, God wants us to live first by the right brain. The right brain 
when God tells us things, he said, that, that's why the Bible says we should become like children. Not in this life, but in, 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 in malice. But in, in understanding, we should become men. But in, in, in malice, we should become like children. In the kingdom, we should become like children. That is, that is how we can take God at his word. Uh, foolishly, foolishly take God at his word. You know, if God says jump, you can stupidly jump uh, without using your left brain to be asking questions. So the challenge that we have always is the, the balance between the left and the right. Okay, now so I'm talking about experience. So when you meet an adult, an adult through experience has come to realize that Number one, you can't do everything. A child thinks that he can do everything. In fact, children think their parents can do everything. Okay, but as an adult, you will see that you can't do everything. Number two, you will see that you can't control everything in this life. Number three, you can't understand everything in this life. You see, so... If, if you, the, the more you grow your maturity, you, you will be able to understand these things. That number one, I can't do everything in this life. I can do some things, but I can't do everything. Number two, I don't know everything in this life. I know some things, but I don't know everything. Number three, I can't control everything in this life. I can control some things, but not everything. And number four, I can't understand everything. I can understand some things, but not everything. That is experience. It will let you know. Now, experience can be pleasant and unpleasant. Unpleasant experiences can also shape our environment. And then pleasant experiences too can shape our environment. Then the, the, fourth, the fifth one is choices. Choices. Choices is also part of nature. And the, you are a sum total of the choices you have made so far in life. At every material moment, you are the sum total of choices you have made. You are here this morning because of a choice you made. Okay? What, what, whatever you are doing now, or most of the things you are doing now uh, is as a result of choices you have made over the years. In fact, sometimes the job you are doing is as a result of the course you chose to study. So you see, cho your, your choices, your choices will affect the direction of your life, whether you like it or not. Um, wrong choices will affect you, and then uh, good choices will also affect you whatever you whatever you do in this life choices will affect you your nature choice is part of nature then the last thing under nature which is the most powerful thing under nature is encounters 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 by encounters i'm talking about influence from things people happenings that are imposing that are imposing those are encounters so people people become products of their encounters maybe you encounter you you will encounter one person and then your your whole mindset is changed you can encounter one situation in life and that will be the game changer for some people they would have become products of the environment but for the encounter they had with the lord jesus then for others others also they changed their lifestyle when they went to prison that was that was that was an encounter something that is very imposing that affected how they they turn out all things being equal okay so then we move on to the impact of nature on nature. 
nature has a lot of impact on nature. So, whilst nature determines your purpose, nature can affect the fulfillment of your purpose. So, you, like Jeremiah, you can be packaged as a prophet to the nations, like Jeremiah, set apart by God as a prophet to the nations, but nature and your environment can change that, can make sure you never fulfill that purpose. When you see madmen walking about, don't think that they, God did not plan for their lives. They had purpose. They had things that God had determined that they should do or be. But nature is what made them so. So nature determines nature determines your purpose, but nature can determine the fulfillment of that purpose. Now, somebody can be destined for great things, but can end up nowhere due to association, wrong association. Wrong association can cancel, can cancel uh, the fulfillment of purpose because they can divert, it can divert your, your attention in your direction. So, number two, nature gives you your job description. But nature empowers you to do the job in life. So na nature will describe for you what you must do. But it's nature that will empower you. That's why we must understand these factors and then how we, we, how we can also, uh, despite all these challenges, we can also rise above the limitation and uh, respond to nature, respond to destiny ordination, respond to abilities, respond to how God created us and make the most out of the, the most out of it. Now, when it comes to nature, the most important part is destiny ordination. The most important part is destiny ordination. What God designed you to do before the foundation of the world. That's the most important part. Uh, when, when, it, when, it, when we come to nature, among the things under nature, like abilities, personalities, hearts, destiny of the nation is the most important. The most important. All the other factors spring from destiny of the nation. And uh, God determines purpose before plan. God determines purpose before plan. His plans are suited to his purpose. His plans are suited to his purpose. Now, if you take a car, for instance, a car, let me use a car as an example. What is the purpose of a car? What is the purpose? Or why was a car made? Why did they make cars when they started making cars the purpose of a car is to transport people and goods from one location to the other that's the purpose of a car but the purpose of the car then gave birth to the plan you know the plan the plan is how is going to do that. So the purpose is why. Why it was made. And the plan is how it's going to function. So the one who made the car, the purpose of the car determined the plan or the design. So the car has been designed with a compartment to carry human beings with a boot or whatever to carry goods. And then because it's designed to move them, it has been equipped with tires, tires to cause it to move, and then also a system of fueling to cause it to run, to move. So all those, all those are part of the plans, but the main purpose is 
how to transport people and, and things from one location to the other. So purposes are determined before plans. And the same thing applies to God. God, God determines purpose before plan. Bible says he declares the end from the beginning. Now, if you look at Genesis 1.28, you will see a popular scripture where Bible says um, uh, God from 26, God, then, then God blessed them and God said, be fruitful and multiply and all that. Then from 26, he said, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the birds of the, over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Now, that, this, in this scripture, what, what is the purpose? What was God's purpose for creating man in this scripture that I just read? What was God's purpose for creating man? What was God's purpose? Dominion. Dominion was God's purpose. But then the plan was to create man in his image. Because it's only God who possesses dominion. What it takes to exercise dominion. Therefore, man had to be created necessarily in God's image so as to make him able to exercise dominion. So, the purpose was dominion, but the plan was image. The purpose was dominion, but the plan, the plan was image. Okay. So, image and dominion. Dominion comes first. Because that's the purpose. He declares the end. Purpose is the end. What a thing must do. Okay. In Mark 3, 14, Jesus gave, Jesus Christ, uh, the Bible says something about Jesus and the, and, the, and the apostles. Mark 3, 14. It says, um, he, he, he called, he appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. So, the purpose, the purpose, the reason why he appointed the twelve was that they might be with him, and then he will send them out to go and preach. Okay, so before you go out to preach, you must be with him. That's that's what it means. Okay, so the most important part of nature is encounters. Encounters. Encounters can sponsor convictions, and those convictions can override what traditions, education, events, etc. have done. So the most important part of nature is encounter, en encounters. So encounters, they sponsor convictions, and these convictions, they can override what your environment has contributed. So a person can start off as a product of his environment, but just an encounter with Jesus can override all that. All that. That's why I'm saying that encounter is more like a lifeline in nature. A lifeline so that, so that when you are going to become a product of your environment and it's going to be bad and you have an encounter with him, then everything changes. Everything changes. Okay. Now, so, let me talk about the discovery of destiny ordination. The discovery of destiny ordination. So, everybody has been packaged by God for a specific assignment on this earth. Now, we are, look, we are talking about knowing yourself as a leader. Okay. So don't, don't, don't get lost. We are looking at knowing yourself as a leader. And we are talking about nature and nature. And under nature, 
We have destiny ordination. We have abilities. We have your personalities. Then uh, uh, that is nature. How God, and then we have your heart, passions, and um, desires. That is that is nature. Nature. How God made you. Nature. Then we talk about nature. Nature as how your environment will shape you and will influence even what is natural, what nature made you, or what God determined you to be, how your environment. And uh, under nature, we saw encounter. Encounter as the most important factor under nature. Now, under nature, we say destiny ordination is the most important factor under nature. And we are looking at what destiny ordination is. And I'm saying that everybody has been packaged by God for a specific assignment on this earth. And God's original design for you is your destiny ordination. And your destiny ordination is a matter of discovery, not decision. You don't decide what you will do. You only discover what God created you to do. And so it's a matter of discovery, not decision. Not decision. But if you look at all the factors and the nature, you will see that destiny ordination uh, will be a sum total of all the factors and the nature. In other words, you will see that your personality, your abilities, your passions were all given to you because of your destiny ordination. Your giftings, your personality, your ability, your passions, they were all given to you because of the calling on your life, because of God's purpose for your life. So your personality will suit God's purpose for your life because it's natural. Your abilities will also suit God's purpose for your life because it's natural. Your passions will also suit God's purpose for your life. When you add all these things, you will see that they fit into one another perfectly. Perfectly. Therefore, in order to maximize your fullest potential in Christ, you must have a thorough understanding of how the various parts of your being, how they interrelate. You see, for instance, as a leader, you must know your personality type. Number two, you must know your abilities. Number three, you must know your passions. And you must know your destiny ordination. And how all these things, they relate with one another. Therefore, it will help you to know how to harness your giftings, manage your personality, and channel your passions into your divine destiny. You harness your giftings, your abilities. And then you must also manage your personality. You must also channel your passions into your divine divine destiny. Okay. So we are going to do something like um, a profile, human profile. So individually, you are going to put certain things down. That will help you to know, get in tune with, get in touch with who you are. It's very important that you understand. Very, very important. You see, sometimes people are deceived into thinking that once you are born again, then it means that automatically everything about you is just going to fall in place. Forgetting that the Bible says that 
when you are born again, you must renew your mind. The renewal of the mind, that is what will help the believer to harness the potentials of the new birth. Otherwise, the new birth is, is give it to me. The new birth is, is in, it will just remain in your spirit. Will just remain in your spirit. Your, your mind will not be affected. You will die and go to heaven, but you cannot fulfill purpose if your mind is unchanged. You, you will die and go to heaven, all right, but your personality can be a hindrance to how effective you become in the hands of God if your mind is not renewed. You will die and go to heaven, all right, but you will be a failure on this earth if your mind is not renewed. And as part of renewing your mind, you must know how these various aspects of your being, how they interrelate and how you can manage them. So we are looking at abilities. So human profile, you can write it down, human profile, your, your own profile. Now, we are going to look at abilities. Abilities. See, the gifting that God has given you, Everybody knows the gift that God has given you. I'm talking about natural giftings, natural abilities, not spiritual gifts. That, that, that will also come, come, come uh, that will also be part of your profile, but we are first looking at natural abilities. So what are my gifts? What am I able to do naturally? With no or little help, that is that is your gift. Simple. Anything that comes to you naturally, you are able to do with no help or very little help, is an ability, and it is God who gave it to you because of your destiny ordination, your calling. Now, many people think that our talents, what we as we call them, they are not important. They are very important. Any talent God gave you, he gave them to you because of your destiny ordination. Now, I usually use the head, the hand, and the feet to describe natural gifts. When I used to teach Sunday school, I, I always used the head, the hands, and the gifts to describe natural gifts. And the reason why I, I did that was in the Bible, you will see these three parts of the body coming together as more like a summary of the human body. Your head, your hand, your feet is a summary of your body. So um, your body literally is able to function, you know, because of these three, these three things. Okay, that's why when Jesus was washing their feet, and he got to Peter. Peter said, Lord, you will never wash my feet. And he just said that, you don't know what I'm doing to you. If I don't wash your feet, then you are not part of me. Then he said, oh Lord, then not only my feet, but my head, my hands, and my, my, my feet. John 13, 9. He said, not only my head, not only my feet, but wash my head and my hands also. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. You see that? He didn't, he didn't say my back, my chest, my stomach. My, he said, said my head, my feet, and my hands. So these are these three, they summarize your entire body. First Corinthians 12, 21. Look at how Paul also summarized the body, the body parts. He summarized the body part um, with these three, these three, it's 12, 21. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. You see, the eye is in the head. Then you see the hand. Then you see the feet. So that's, that, 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 that's why I chose the head, the hand, and the feet to summarize gifts. Um, well, any gifts you have, you may be able to categorize them 
under these three broad headings. Okay. So, the head refers to all the talents that flow out of the mouth and your brain. All the talents, all the natural gifts that flow through your mouth and your brain. That, that is, that is uh, that, what, what the head stands for. So, singing. You know, people can sing and it's a gift. Uh, you, you, you may desire to sing, but your voice will betray you. We will know that you are not cut out for singing because of your voice. Then speaking is also a gift. There are people whose gift is speaking. They have a penchant for speaking and a flair and a knack for speaking. You know, they are able to put their thoughts in words. And some of them are eloquent. Some can speak very well. And it's a gift. It's a gift. And if you if, if, if you don't know, I'm telling you, it's a gift. There are some people who don't know that they have that gift. You can speak. And it's a gift. Just that you are not using the gift well. Okay, then creativity, creativity. That one is also with the brain, with the mind, with the head, creativity. We have pe people who are very creative, creative, creative imagination and all that. Inventions, people who are inventors, they are gifted in their brain. In fact, in their right brain. Inventors are like children. Inventors. They are like children. They think like children. You see, that something that you will, you will think is impossible, you will think is impossible, an inventor will be troubled about it, trying to see how it can work. Do you know that the people who invented aeroplane, what are their names? The right, right brothers. Do you know that the first time they announced, then they were Christians. The first time they announced their idea in church, the people said that they were wi wizards. The first time they announced the idea in church that I believe I can fly. I believe I can fly. And they said that you are a wizard. That's why you are demonic. Because they didn't have a grid for that. How can a human being be floating or suspended in the air without any supernatural powers? It's impossible. So the first response was, it's impossible. But you see, it never left them. And they kept on dreaming. That's why inventors are dreamers. So sometimes you, you think that they are childish because of the way they think. But most of the most of the things that have been invented, they were by people who were using their right brain. Right brain. People who are gifted in, in the brain, for instance, the right brain, they become authors. Authors, creative writing, people who write novels and all that they are they are gifted in their right brain. You have to be able to create a story, you know, and uh, the way they're able to create and expand and sustain your interest, literally, from beginning to the end. You see, I used to read a lot of detective novels when I was um, when I was young, like a teenager. I stopped when I got to this form. I used to read many detective novels of you know how a serial killer will be killing people, and then an investigator will unravel the mystery. And then he will, you know, he will get the person and all that. The silence of the lambs, gone but not forgotten. These are top, top detective novel, novels. Some of them have become uh, movies and all that. And I used to read them. And you, you can see that this thing is just made up. Somebody has created it. But it looks so real. It looks so real and it's like, 
when you start reading, it, they, will, they will grip your interest from beginning to the end. That is a gift. It's a gift. There are people who can create things with their mind. They are gifted with the right brain. Yes. Um, movie directors. Those who write, who direct movies, who write uh, scripts. They are gifted with the right brain. You may not be able to do it. And you may even wonder how they do it. How can they put a story together like that? And the story is a figment of somebody's imagination. It's the creation of somebody's mind. It's not a real story. But the person is able to put it together and it's so real to you. It's a gift. Okay. And there are many other gifts also that are connected to the mouth and then the brain, the right brain. If I the left brain, it's also a gift. The left brain. There are people who are realists. They are realists. Realists are people who always take things as they are, not as they can be. Not as you hope them to be, as they are. They are realists. They are always real. Realists. Now, there are people who, they, that, that's, the, that's the left brain. You see, the left brain, that's where reality resides. Your left brain. Reality resides in your left brain. When God is speaking to you, the, the words of God, they target the right side of your brain. Your imagination. That's why God speaks in pictures. God gives you a dream. Uh, uh, and the dream is talking about something big. It's not the real situation, but it's a picture. I remember one time I went to us to preach and somebody came to me. And the person was so discouraged. The person said, I see myself in dreams. I'm healing the sick. I'm raising cripples. I'm doing this. Then somebody wakes me up from the dream and I get angry because I realize that it's just me. You see, that's, that's the right, that's how God speaks. So sometimes when, when we say God has spoken to you, now the realist will not understand you, you know, because they don't think in terms of pictures. They think in terms of facts and figures. It's a, it's a gift. People who are gifted in their left brain, they have they, are, they don't think in, in terms of pictures. Okay, so those are the people who can, um, they can be very good businessmen. The, those who are gifted in their left brain, they can be very good businessmen. You know, they can be, um, they can, they, they are people who look at things as they are. And then we have the hands. The hands to your ability may be in your hand. This one is a natural ability. I don't know the, the teaching. You, you must be able to build your own profile and know, have a fair idea of what you can do, what you can't do. We get frustrated when we, we try to fit where we have not been cut to fit. Yes. You see, for instance, me, I know that I'm not good with tools. Tools. I'm not good with tools. You see, for it, if you give me something to you dismantle something and you tell me to fix it, I'll have to struggle to fix it. That's not but but, but I know where my gift is. If you ask me to design something with my mind or to draw a plan or to do something, I will do it quickly. But if you bring a machine and you say, okay, look at it well, I'm going to dismantle it. Now, when I finish, put it back, I'll be found wanting. That's not where, that's not where my strength is. You know, so you must know. But there are some people who are gifted with their hands. They love to handle tools. They love to handle tools. When they come right now, when they come here right now, they can Within a short time, they can be, I mean, they can pick how to fix things, certain things. Like these gadgets they fix and all that. There are people who are like that. You know, they, 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 they can fix. If you teach them, within a short time, they will just fix. Others also will struggle. 
with it. If you if you give me a map to follow, I may struggle with the map. Yes, a map, a map. This is a this this is the the plan. Let's translate it to the ground. I always take time. I t I force, and I take a, a lot of time to read and to translate it to the ground. But if it's about picturing, imagination, creating something, that one I don't take much time. I can just create something for you right now. I can just create, paint, paint a picture in my mind right now. Then, there are people who are more motor driven than mind driven. See, that's why in education, they, they brought technical education. Because they realize that there are some people, they are more motor driven. It's like they are, they are, their gifting is in their hands. They have to do something with their hand. They become very good at things we use our hands to do. Yes. Even designers, you know, there are people who can use their hands, you know, that those who sew. Not those who design, but those who sew, the barbers, the tailors. I mean, these are gifts you can learn. But there are some who have a natural flair. There are people who even started sewing, sewing before they, they had they had uh, formal uh, 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 yeah education. It comes naturally. Then the feet. Refers to sportsmen. People are also gifted in their feet. Athletic. Some people are gifted with athletic bodies. I know some people, no matter how they eat, they will never put on. No matter how they eat. And they really eat. But it will, it will never show on their body. They eat palm, but you will not see it. They are sportsmen. They are, they are, they are, they, that's their gift in the feet. Natural gift. Then we have spiritual gift. You must also know your spiritual gift. But your spiritual gift, uh, they are given to you before you, you are even born naturally. Second Timothy 1 9, grace was given to us in Christ before the world began. Grace was given to us in Christ before the world began. It says, Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. So anything spiritual, grace was given to you. He said, Before I ordained you in your mother's womb, I, I, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I ordained you as a prophet. So, before the person was born, your spiritual giftings were determined in Christ Jesus. Why? Because he chose us from the foundation of the world in Christ Jesus. And if he chose us, that he determined our spiritual giftings. When you become born again, then these giftings they manifest. They manifest now, and those manifestations of the gifts also is your responsibility to find, follow, and fulfill your spiritual giftings or ordination. That is your responsibility. That's why I'm saying that knowing yourself as a leader. Now, we can't go into spiritual gift for now, but I want to give you an over overview. But you know, I've, I've thought about the gift of the Spirit recently. But when it comes to spiritual gifts, there are three categories of spiritual gifts. The first one is governmental gifts. Governmental gifts. That is a five-fold ministry gift. The fivefold ministry offices. These are men and women who are gifts to the body. They are gifts that Jesus gave to.
to the body. He gave gifts unto men. Actually, it is he gave men as gifts. And he gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, which we call the fivefold ministry. In Ephesians 4, 11 to 16, that is where it is located in the Bible. And, and, and 1 Corinthians 12, 28 also talks about the ministry gift, the governmental gift. Now, a person may be called into the gov- one of the governmental gifts or offices as a, as his destiny ordination. Okay, and so the calling, uh, the calling is not your responsibility, but the training. You have a role to play in the training, and then the training consists of finding. Uh, following and fulfilling God's plan for your life. That one is your responsibility because you have to cooperate with God to be able to find and then to follow and then to fulfill. That is not God's. God's part is to call you and he will reveal the calling to you. Then number two, we have ministry gifts. That we find in Romans 12, 7 to 8. Now, maybe next week we'll talk about the spiritual gifts. And then uh, I will give you a questionnaire that will guide you to be able to know your dominant gifts. Everybody has dominant gifts and uh, recessive giftings. You see, there are some giftings that are dominant. That are dominant. These are the ones that that are... Dominant. There are other ones that are recessive, but they are also your gifted. So in building your profile, you must know your dominant gifts and your recessive gifts. In Romans 12, 7 to 8, the Bible lists certain ministry gifts. These are ministry gifts, or what some people call motivational gifts. Uh, go to verse, verse 5, having the uh, gifts different. Okay. It says, so we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Okay? No, I mean, we are continuing. We are reading from verse 5. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. So he's talking about gifts, different gifts. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. This one, so ministry gifts, these are our ministry let us use it in our ministry. Here it's talking about service. Ministry here is service, help. So there are some people who have the gift of service. It's, it may be a dominant gift or a recessive gift, but you have it. That you, you see the kind of things that attract you and how you drive fulfillment even uh, in, as, as a believer. There are people who derive fulfillment when they serve when they serve, they, they always want to serve. It's a gift. And you must develop that gift as a leader and enhance that gift. Then he who teaches in teaching. Teaching too is a gift. This, this teaching is not like a governmental gift, but it's a ministry gift, teaching. Not the office of a teacher, but teaching the ability to instruct to cause people to understand that's teaching so you see that somebody may may have a desire to teach or a flair for teaching somebody may have it it's a gift it's a gift whether it's bible study or children ministry or church or wherever the teaching is a gift there, there are people who even I uh, love to teach, even even naturally, they love to teach. It's like it's even as a student, or maybe as a as a yeah, as a student, you will see that they've always gathered their their fellow, their colleague students, and then they are trying to teach them. You see this these giftings. Then uh he will exalt in exhortation. Now, exhortation is also a gift, the ministry of exhortation or encouragement. There are people who are gifted like that. 
An example in the Bible is Barnabas. Barnabas who was called the son of consolation. When he is around, you see that he can motivate you. He can encourage you. See, people who are motivated, they can really motivate you. They can really encourage you. And some also can preach. You know, well, this one is not the office of an evangelist, but exaltus, exaltus, exaltation. He who leads with diligence, leadership is also a gift. I, I, I've, I've spoken about uh, de facto leaders and, and all that. There are people who are also natural leaders. They love to lead. Now, it's a, it's, it's, it's a gift. It's a gift. Who, that, who told uh, somebody to go and stand for president? Why is it that not everybody would like to go and stand for president? But there are people who something in them tells them that they must be president. It, it, it's a gift. It's not like that something in them pushes them that they must offer themselves to, to, to be voted on. So, politics and all is a gift. When, when, you are, when you are in in primary school or secondary school, you see that there are people who they, they love to be leaders. They love to be leaders. There are people who, who are always running run away from positions. They don't want to face the people. They don't want to lead. They are always running away. You know? Yes. So, But there are some who are born leaders who always love to lead. They are, they are very strong willed people opinionated they they have strong convictions and they are able to convince others to follow their convictions you when you watch children even at play you can identify those who are leaders there are some among them they determine the direction of the game and what game they should play and what they should do. You see that those ones, they are natural leaders. People are always following them. Have you not seen some in primary school? You see gangs. This one is a leader. People are following him. They, he doesn't know what he's doing, but his followers believe him. And they really think that he knows where he's going. <laughs> they don't know that he's as confused as they are. <laughs> but that's leadership. Then he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Mercy is also a gift. Can you imagine? Mercy is a gift. You see, that, that is what people who are giving to hospitality and then um, uh, the, the people who are able to reach out to the sick, the poor, you know, like, you know, Mother Teresa, the work that she was doing, it's not everybody who has that heart to do that, to be uh, uh, ministering to the poor in the gutters, you know, and all that and all that. Some people will give their money to the poor, but they cannot help them. They can't literally go down to them and help them. It's not in them. Not everybody can work in an orphanage, for instance. It doesn't matter how anointed or how you have the desire. You mean there are people who are naturally gifted. Now, there are, you can, everybody can also work there, but there are people who are naturally, I mean, they have the gift of mercy, and it's a spiritual gift. So you can covet it and pray for it. Yes, you can pray for it. Do you know it's not everybody who has a passion to maybe convert Muslims or other People of, people of other faith. But there are some people with that passion. They are praying for them. They are interceding for them. They are devising means of reaching out to them and all that. There are people who would like to reach out to um, drug addicts, mental, mental, uh, mentally ill patients. Not everybody has the patience 
to handle mental patients. Then, uh, okay, he who gives, I think that's the next one. Okay, I, I skip giving. So giving is also a gift. There are people who, uh, every though, every, even though every believer is supposed to be a giver, there are some who have it as a gift. Yes. And those ones, is, they, they, God also blesses them more than the average believer because of this gift of giving. And it's like they give and they are not tired of giving and they give and give. And if you give and give, you will get and get. Uh -huh. So that's why God also blesses them. And these are financiers of the, of the, of the kingdom. It's a gift. It's, in fact, it's a ministry. It's a ministry. And there, there are people who will not really be praying that, oh God, use me to save souls. Use me to heal the sick. But they will be praying that, oh God, give me money to push the gospel. And, and some of them are business people and God raises them as industrialists, businessmen with big platforms and all that they are concerned about is how to pump money into the gospel. It's a gift. These are ministry gifts. Then the third category of gifting is a sign gift. The sign gifts are the ones in 1 Corinthians 12, 7 to 10. Uh, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, design of spirits, gift of faith, working of miracles, gifts of healings, prophecy, uh, gift of diverse tongues, interpretation of tongues. These nine gifts are the sign gifts. Those are the what we call the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They are the sign gifts. We call them the sign, the sign gift, signs, you know, they, 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 they show, they, they manifest, manifest. Okay, so in writing your profile as a leader, you must know your natural giftings and number two, know your spiritual giftings. So you can write them down. Now, I've not gotten into the details. I'm just giving you an overview today. Then later on, we will go through the questionnaire, not today, so that they, it can help you to locate your dominant gifts and then the ones that are recessive. And you also know that martyrdom is a gift. Martyrdom is a gift. Yes, there are people who are called to be martyrs. If, if you have been, if you have a passion, have a passion to send the gospel to Muslims, especially, or to, I mean, you, 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 you love to die for the gospel, Maybe you are a martyr. Yes. So you, you that person, don't don't waste somebody's time. Don't go and marry somebody and to waste to waste the person's time. <laughs> Let's say if God is sending you to Af Af Afghanistan, <laughs> Afghanistan, don't come and marry my daughter. <laughs> go, go, go. Yeah, you are a martyr. Go, you <laughs> and. You see, the, yes, it's true. There are some people who have that, who have that desire. They, they, they have the desire. And yes, like, you know, for saving was a matter, you know, at the early apostles, most of them were mat matter. They were killed for their faith. They, they have a gift of celibacy also, a gift that enables people to live single throughout their lives. <laughs> to live single. <laughs> To live single throughout their lives. Yes. See, we, we don't have such gifts in this ministry. <laughs> Paul, Paul said, I wish that I wish that you were as I am, but everyone has his own gift and his own calling. So it's a gift, it's a gift. There are some that there are some that God did not uh, wire them to get married, they will not see the need. They will not even think about it. And they are so fulfilled. They are so fulfilled being single. They are not thinking about marriage. You know, and it, that even when you tell them, you ask them, it's like you are worrying them. It, 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 there are some also who are like that because it's not normal. Yes. But I'm talking about those that are normal. There are some, they are like that. It's not normal. Some people, 
by this, by a certain age, they should be thinking about marrying. But it's like they don't even, it's not part of their calculation. Uh -huh. That one is not normal. But if the person is he has a gift of celibacy, then you see grace will be given for the person to live single and fully single throughout his life. Yes. Like Paul. Paul never married. Like Sadhu Sanda Saraj. He too never married. And he said the Lord Jesus told him not to marry. And so, yes, and so he's single. He has been single from, I mean, all his life. He never married, never had any girlfriend, never had anything. Yes, and he's single throughout going to uh, heaven. <laughs> Some of you are like, no, I, this gift, I don't want it. <laughs> I don't want this gift. <laughs> even, even when at that time, somebody was preaching, the person said that Jesus is coming very soon. That somebody answered on the, one of the platforms. He said that hey, you should wait till we are, we are about to marry. Let's marry before he comes. <laughs> then after spiritual gifts, then you come to passions. You also have to know your passions and your drives. Where your passion is. In fact, passion is, is very, very important. In fact, uh, it's very difficult to get results when you are doing something you have no passion for. Yes. And then also, it's difficult to be fulfilled when you are doing something you have no passion for. You will easily tire out. Because passion is like fuel that keeps you going. Passion and drive is like fuel that keeps you going. All, most of the NGOs, with the exception of ones that were formed by businessmen to make money, most of the real, real, real NGOs were birthed out of passion. Real NGOs. People, there are people who have passion for all kinds of things. People have passion for, for preservation of uh, nature. There's somebody um, in Ghana here, friends, of waters and river bodies. And he's so concerned about preserving our water bodies. Something that maybe you will, will see as totally, I mean, very, very far from you. But that is his passion. I mean, and, and it's natural. You must know where your passion is. So these are some questions to help you to identify your passion. Number one, what grieves my heart anytime I think about it? What grieves your heart anytime you see it or think about it? There are people with passion for street children. When they see street children, they have passion. There are people with passion for orphans. People with passion for... Um, for trees, trees, afforestation. <laughs> Many people have different, different passion. <laughs> what would I have loved to do if money was not a factor? What would I have loved to do if money was not a factor? It's a clue to your passion. What drives you? You must know. Number three. What local, global, political, social, or church issue causes strong emotional stirrings in you? Those issues, when you hear about them, they cause strong stirring from you. I discovered some time ago, from some time ago, I discovered that when I see people without fathers, I, I can't, my heart just breaks. I discovered it from, you know, um, from the year 2000 and even before. It's a passion. It's a passion. So, so Mission J127, for instance, was 
born out of that passion. I started going to orphanages before I had J127, I, before I formed J127. I started going to orphanages just to visit them. And one day I remember I went to Kumasi Children's Home and uh, that one, I was, in, I was, I think I was doing service, not just service, uh, six form service. When I got there, I asked permission to see the children. When I got there, and the children were calling me daddy, and I was, I was, I mean, tears were coming like that. Yes, they were calling, they were saying daddy, the children, and tears. That is my one of my passions. I have some, I have some other other passions, but that's one of my passions, and so. J127 is something that is very dear to my heart. Very, very dear to my heart. I don't, I, it's very dear to my heart. So my, my eyes are on the, on that ministry. My eyes are on, because it's passion. There are people too who have passion for um, mentally, uh, special children. When they see special children, they break down. I hope you know special children. Yes. Not everybody can handle them. You have to pray for that kind of passion because it's like people are naturally uh, predisposed towards them, but others also you must you must pray for the pray for the, that passion or learn because not everybody can handle. When you go to special children's school or you go to uh, anchor for or a cross cycle, you you will respect the nurses who give care to these people. You will see that some of them are just employed, but some also are real. It's like it's coming out of them. Passion. What kind or group of people do you feel most attracted to? Is is your passion? What group of people do you feel most attracted to? Even in ministry, you will see that. You are maybe attracted to elderly people, old people, or yeah, or children, or young people, or let's say people have uh, attraction for different people groupings. Maybe have caste. There are people whose main passion is to reach out to them. Yes. What is the area of need? which is of ultimate importance to you. Uh -huh. So then, if you could not fail, what would you do? What one thing would you do in order to make a difference? If you couldn't fail, that's an indication of your passion. Yes. And the things you love to, what can you do? What, what, what um this, this uh, let me put it this way what is that thing that doesn't you you don't easily get bored doing is an indication of your passion because anything that is your passion you don't easily get bored doing it you can you can you can do it morning to evening you will not be bored you will not be bored there are, there are people who can um, they can minister to drug addicts, have time for them, drug addicts, prostitutes, and people who need help like that. There are people with that passion. In what areas of your church ministry would you like to make impact with your life and spiritual gifts? If you look at this ministry, for instance, what areas would you really want to offer your services? Is it the choir? Is it the technical? Is it the children's ministry? Is it Ms. J127? Is it 3G? Is it um, yeah, guys and girls? Is it uh, warriors and builders? This same Jesus? These are these are all, all, all watches. <laughs> watches. Now, these are areas. You see that everybody and the area that he's most attracted to. When people come to this ministry, there are some people I know who 
uh, the only area in the ministry that they are really, really concerned is Mr. J127. Yes. If I, I know somebody who comes, who comes for camp meeting once a year, and the reason why she comes is J127. Yes. And so you see that now you 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 your your drive may be towards glory choir, glory incorporated. That's where you can release your best. That is passion. It's very important. It's very. It's better to have people uh, who have passion for what they do. You see, you you may be you may be um, you may be sincere, but you may not make much impact when you don't have passion for what you are doing. Passion for what you are doing. When you see somebody with passion, you will see that the person is never tired. The person loves to do the thing. I mean, he loves to do it. Uh, he's not, he, it's nothing you, you love to do. If, if, if you don't have a passion for children, you'll be frustrated working with children. Very frustrated. Because it takes, it takes passion. You have to be a lover of children to be able to work with children and being a lover of children means that you have a passion for them because you can easily get bored with them when i say bored it's not the the bored that you use as english i'm talking about boredom not angry people have imported pigeon into english so uh, i was bored which means i was angry that that's wrong i was bored means that boredom set in so you can easily get bored working with them because it's like they will really exhaust you. Really, really exhaust you. <laughs> so passion is very important. But you know, the, the, the good thing is that you can develop an area of passion. Yes. You see, uh, if let's say God tells you, you, go and work here in this area, of ministry and you know that you don't have passion for that it means that there's grace available you can pray for the passion to work there because God said you should work there you can pray for the passion to to work there if you look at how Paul was so passionate about the Jews it is amazing that God never sent him to the Jews <laughs> so sometimes it Passion alone cannot be a determinant of ministry. Paul was so passionate of the Jews. In fact, it got to a point, he said, I wish I was accursed so that my Jewish brethren would be saved. But God said, no, you are going to the Gentiles. Then Peter, who is not well educated when it comes to the law, God said, go to the Jews. Paul was very well educated. He sat under Gamaliel. And Paul, in human wisdom, Paul would have made a better Jewish missionary. In human wisdom. Look at even the book of Hebrews, which I believe was written by Paul. Because of the depth of, the depth of, uh, the, the profundity of knowledge in Hebrews. I believe that it was written by Paul. Because apart from Paul, who else was so knowledgeable and deep I mean, even Peter, Peter admitted that our brother Paul, God has given him wisdom. And when he writes his letters, we even struggle to understand because he's so deep. So the book of Hebrews, which talks about deep things like Melchizedek and, and, and other deep issues, it's, I believe it's Paul. I believe it's Paul. Even though, theologically speaking, um, they say they don't, have, they don't, have, they don't have the author of Hebrew, but I believe it's Paul. So, but Paul was not sent to the Jews. Can you imagine? And God sent him to the Gentiles. And so, Paul must pray for passion to be able to release the same passion into the missionary work towards the Gentiles. In fact, uh, it got to a point in Romans chapter 1, verse um, 16. Romans 1, uh, 16, Paul says something. 
um, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. The verse 17 says what? Okay, no, I mean, go to, um, uh, I think, 14. Yeah, 14. I just wanted to show something. Yes. It says, I'm a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians. You see, let me, let me define passion for you. Okay. It says, I'm a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians. Why is he a debtor? That is, that is passion. He's, he's, he's a debtor. He's a debtor. I mean, uh, he, it's like he owes them. He owes them. It's like he has to spend his life for them. Somebody who did not have, whose real passion was toward Jews, but he's now a debtor to Greeks, that is Gentiles, and to barbarians, people who have not even heard of God. But he was passionate about the Jews, both to the wise and to the unwise. I have verse 15. So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. Who well, passion is first of all a debt. Number two, readiness. When, when you see passion, you see readiness. You are ready to, to do something, to do that thing. Readiness. Then number three, verse, uh, uh, okay, yeah, yeah. So this is the normal thing. He's not ashamed. So passion is something you are not ashamed to do. When you do things with passion, you are not ashamed. You do it with zeal. When you see people who lack zeal, it's an indication that they don't have passion what they are doing. They don't like it. Anything you like doing will see zeal. You will come alive when you, you get into it. You may not even be gifted for it, but you have passion for it. Have you not seen people who are so, so passionate for football? Even when they smell the scent of football, at the scent of football, they come alive. Yes. That's what I mean. They can smell football. And the scent of football can literally rejuvenate them, come alive with football. That's their passion. They have strong passion. Football. Me, for instance, if they play World Cup behind my house, chance that I will never go to the stadium. <laughs> I'm telling you the truth. If they play World Cup, I would rather watch it on TV. But there are some who want to go to the stadium and sit down. In fact, I remember years back, we were children. There was a popular match between Kotoko and Zamalek of Egypt. And people climbed the floodlight. Stadium floodlight. In fact, some died. Yes. And that match, the match started I think 2. It was a Sunday, 2 p.m. People were at the stadium 4 a.m. Talk of passion. <laughs> 4 a.m. What were they doing there? I mean, and I don't, okay, maybe it wasn't shown live at that time. I don't know. But what, that's, I mean, whatever. What, why would you get up at four to go and sit at the stadium to wait for a match that will begin at two? And the answer is passion. And if you ask them, are they going to receive part of the winning bonus? The answer is no. They just love football. That's passion. And it's, it's not wrong. It's not wrong. It's only wrong when, when a football match clashes with a church activity and there's a temptation for you to disregard your time with the Lord to watch football. It means your passion has gotten the better half of you. And your passion is coming between you and God. So it's very, it's very important. We need passion. Wherever you have been called to serve, pray for passion and find out the area that you are most passionate about and serve there. You will see you become effective. 
because you are passionate about that. Do you know something? I discovered one thing when I was teaching children that most of the time I will be going through what I will teach on Sunday in the course of the week. When I'm at work, I'll be looking for teaching aids. I'll be looking for illustrations. You see, passion is when you are not, the thing, the time is not due, you are even thinking about it. That's passion. Yes. It is the same thing as preaching. I mean, literally, throughout the week, I'm thinking about what I'm going to preach. I know what I'm going to preach, but I'm rehearsing in my mind, praying through it, doing everything, you know, putting down point. Sometimes I will gather my point, you know, from Monday to maybe Wednesday or Thursday before I will sit down to finally write it or type it. That is when you have passion for what you do. That's what you do. I have a passion for teaching. I can, I can teach, like as I'm doing now, I can teach from now to 6 p.m. I will not get tired. If, if you like, let's, let's just, just throw the challenge. Let's, let's bet. Let's bet. <laughs> if you like, dare me, dare me, just dare me. We can close at six. Because I love to teach. That's, 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 that's one thing you must know. I love to teach. Because it's, my, it's, it's a passion. It's a passion. <laughs> it's a passion. And everybody who loves to teach, you, you can't give him 30 minutes and say teach. So you have to know. You, see, you have to understand certain things. <laughs> Because, yes, last Sunday I was telling the pastor, I said that, you show me any teacher, real teacher of the gospel, who teaches for just 30 minutes. Show me. Because when you come, you are so loaded. You have to release. And you, you need time to build, lay foundation. You see, even how you do your makeup, you are all teachers. You lay foundation, then you do what I understand. We even have um uh you no know, the, the one they do on, on cars, the, the one they do on, on cars, body works. No, that term, I've forgotten that term. To fill in foundation. Okay, then we move on to Personality. Personality. Okay. So, now, personality is very important. You must understand your personality. And here too, we can ask some questions. So, now, and again, I'm not really going into details. I'm just giving an overview. You know, because we have, you know, we have the basic personality differences that we all know. Sanguine, um, um, Choleric, melancholic, uh, phlegmatic. These are uh, Greek Greek philosophers who came up with that, and they 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 did that categorization based on body fluids, the fluid that we have in our bodies, the blood, the tears, the phlegm, you know. Uh, for the for the sanguine, uh, they have the the blood. Then for the cholerics, the sweat. Then for the phlegmatics, the phlegm. And the melancholics, the tears. So they use these four fluids. And then they categorize human personality, uh, human behavior into these four categories. And uh, I believe that it's true. Just that we have to also understand that uh, there are there are, there are weaknesses with every kind of personality, and there are also strengths. And what the Holy Spirit does is to help us to overcome the weaknesses as far as, as, far as we can cooperate with him. He will help us to overcome the weaknesses that are with, the, with our personality. So, 
Now, but I'm asking these questions. Are you an extrovert or an introvert? That is one thing that you must know about yourself. Now, an extrovert is an individual who gets his, um, the word I use here is rejuvenation. Or let me say, assuming you were, you were a, a, a phone, uh, your batteries are charged as an extrovert when you are with people. An extrovert, they always need to be around people. Otherwise, they can get lonely and depressed. That's how their batteries are charged. That's how they are rejuvenated. See, that's, that's a, a personality trait. Now, they feel they, they always need to be around people. So an extrovert will take delight in public appearances and public places or public gatherings. And they, are, they come alive when, they, when they, are, they are among people, they come alive. Meanwhile, an introvert will be dodging, hiding behind. They don't really like um, public <laughs> gatherings. They, they, they get their batteries charged when they are alone. They, they love solitude. Solitude. You see, despite the fact that I love teaching, I, when, when I talk too much, if it's not teaching, I see too much talking as draining. Sometimes I don't have the urge to be talking plenty. So you, when, when you see me teach, you, you may think I'm an extrovert, but I'm not. From this definition, I'm an introvert. Because my batteries are charged when I'm alone. I prefer to be alone most of the time. I, I, can, I can stay indoors the whole day, not going out, and I will not feel bored. That is how an introvert is. But an extrovert is not like that. Now, being an extrovert or introvert is not an indication of weakness or strength, necessarily. But it is how it is deployed into your destiny ordination, that is what actually counts. It's not a weakness to be an introvert. And it's not a weakness to be an extrovert. It's natural. It's natural. If I tell you the effort I put into speaking in public, you will not believe it. It, 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 it didn't come naturally with me. People think that, oh, I'm a natural speaker. No, no. I, it, I, I literally forced myself to do that. And then also, the, the, the anointing of God, the grace of God that came upon me also helped me to do that. Because before then, before when I was a teenager, the one thing I dreaded was to be asked to speak in public. My voice would be shaking, and sometimes my body would be shaking. And I could not hold a microphone to, to be looking at people's face to speak. And so I thought I could overcome it by joining the drama group. And so I went to join the drama group and then went for uh, meetings and all that. Then I realized that when they were uh, giving the rules, I will always want to dodge because I, I didn't want to be the one. But then when I got to know the Lord as a teenager, then started listening to God's word, and then uh, church activities, evangelism, leadership, and all that, I then that thing left. It, 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 it left. It left. Then number two, are you a thinker? Or a feeler. You must also ask yourself. Thinkers are more logical than emotional. Thinkers. They, they like to deal with objective facts. 
their feelings are not all that visible thinkers in decision making. But feelers are more emotional than logical. Feelers like to experience things and they are more subjective. And if you look at this, the natural disposition of most men is that they are thinkers and most women are feelers. But that is just general. So, a man naturally, generally, men are logical and women are emotional. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's, it's neither strength nor weakness. It's just nature. It's just nature. And everybody has... The reason why God put man and woman together is so that they can complement their differences. Do you know, for instance, that if you were a man, there are certain things that you will never, you, you will always overlook. Because generally, men are, men look at the general facts, but women are more detailed. So, as a man, you will just summarize, okay, uh, generally, one plus one is two, then we'll move. But a woman will look at the details. The one, is it straight or is bent? And the two, two, is it, is the tail long or short? Before you add the two. So, if you are somebody who sees emotions as weakness, then it's, it's not good. Then you don't understand nature. Emotions are not weakness at all. In fact, they are uh, uh, people, you must be in tune with your emotions as a leader. You can't, you, you see, when you don't display emotions, it does not mean you are strong. It does not mean, listen, Jesus wept at Lazarus' tomb. Jesus, our Jesus, he wept. <laughs> yes. And it wasn't a display of weakness. Well, a display of vulnerability, it, it meant that he was sad. Which means that there are times when you must be in tune with your emotions. The only thing is you should not allow your emotions to drive you to make hasty decisions that you regret. When you follow emotions, you see there are certain things when you follow them, the results will always be negative. When you follow emotions too much, when you follow pain, that's why all those who were named by women in the Bible, they named them out of pain because of the woman's natural tendency to be emotional. Ichabod, the glory has departed. She named Ichabod in pain. Jabez, Jabez, the mother bore him with sorrow, with pain. Benoni, while her soul was departing, she, she gave the child a name, Benoni. And Benoni is a bad name. You see, then Benoni means son of sorrow. Then Jacob said, no, Benjamin, son of my right hand. So you see that that's why uh, uh, there are certain rules be, that God gives men because of their strength and certain rules he gives women because of their strength. Yes. And you must, you must know why God gave you your emotions and don't, don't abuse your emotion. Number three, do I enjoy routine or spontaneity and variety? It's very important. Your personality type, do you enjoy routine or you always want to see new things? Not everybody, see, there are some people who will love to work in a civil service or work in a controlled environment where there's a definite process and procedure that you follow. Now, that's personality. There are people who, who cannot work in a free environment where, which involves risk-taking, 
thinking on your feet, responding to pressure, responding at little or short notice. There are people who can survive in that kind of environment, but there are others who can do that. So you will see that melancholics, for instance, they are very methodical. They take long in deciding uh, because they are slow to decide because they are very methodical, they are very procedural, they are easily unsettled, unsettled by change. If you place a melancholic at the forefront of an institution that is always changing, it's going to create problems. You have to place somebody who loves spontaneity or variety that's the person's strength because this institution may be has to be changing changing responding at short notice and all that pressure and all that there are people if you tell them tomorrow you are traveling uh, you have you have messed up their you have messed up their life i mean i mean they will be completely disorganized because they will, they will love to plan their travel from a month a month earlier to be able to gather themselves gather put, bring all their energies to know that they are traveling but there are some also you can tell them tomorrow we are moving so, okay we move and they will just move now so this one will help you to know which kind of task will be suited to you. Suited to you. There are people, if you put them in, a, in an enclosed place where they are dealing with files, ah, they'll be bored. Files. Put this file here. Do this. They'll be bored. They want to be out there interacting with people. Out and about. So you must know who you, which one you are. Those who are accommodation of routine are usually good managers. They are very, they are very detailed. People are detailed. They, 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 they take things one at a time. They are detailed. They are timetable people. They can follow timetable. Well, I remember once I met a guy and I was doing a service. And I met him, he was my friend. I said, oh, your card for your payment, I was working at the secretary, so your card for your payment is ready. I've put it somewhere. Then we were just in front of the secretary. You know what he told me? He said, okay, I didn't, I didn't put it in my program today. So tomorrow I'll put it in my program and I'll come for it. I was surprised. <laughs> Because it was just a working day from here to where the gate is. And I said, oh, your thing is ready, so come for it. He said, oh, oh, then I'll, oh, tomorrow, today I didn't put it in my program. I don't know whether it wanted to impress me or what. I don't know, but I was really surprised. Not impressed, I was surprised. <laughs> I said, ah. So what, what is wrong with just working and saving, to, saving your, the same energy you used to come? But see, that is how some people are, you must understand. There are people that you must give them enough notice to be able to pull them along. You see, you can't just pull them along like that. No, there are some people you must give them a month's notice. So, but you see, you can always change. You can always change. If I look at myself, for instance, there are certain things I do, they are not in line with my, my temperament or my, my personality. Yes, you, you, can, you, can, you can easily get me wrong because, for instance, I, like I said, I am talking right now, but I love solitude. That's my real nature. My real nature is to stand somewhere quietly and be thinking about myself. I can stand on one spot, two hours, one spot, standing, leaning against a pillar, two hours, and I'm thinking about myself and thinking about myself and thinking about life. I will not be bored. So when you see that 
I'm in a crowd and I'm interacting with people, it's something I, re- I really struggle to do. I, sh- I used to struggle to do that. I had to learn to do that because of leadership. Yes, so I, I'm, I'm, what I'm saying is, yeah, you don't say, you, you know, there are no stereotypes, had a, had a, had a uh, fast rules. You don't say, oh, for me, I'm this, I can't change. Sometimes the demands of your job will mean that <laughs> you, uh, you change. Even though you can never change the core, but you can always, you can always change the other things. If, if I had, if, do you know what I really love to do? What I really, really love to do is to be in a quiet place, reading. Yes, reading. If you surround me with books, you can leave me for days. No problem. I can sit down and be reading. I will not be bored. Hey. But the things, the, the kind of things I, 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 I do demand that you have to be moving up and down, going here, doing that. All those, they are not part of my makeup. I had to learn to do that. I had to force myself to do that. Those who are timetable people, they prefer to do things systematically and methodically. But those who lack spontaneity, they are risk takers. They are leaders and pioneers. They love to take risk. There are people who move ahead. So number, number, number five, am I a pioneer or a settler? There are some people who have the spirit of pioneering. They like new beginnings. And they can feel stifled by routine. There are people who don't like routine. You see, for instance, a typical, a typical evangelist, a typical evangelist, you will see that they are the spiritual version of pioneers. A typical, some, someone who is an evangelist to the core, you will see that they love spontaneity. An evangelist cannot sit with a church to, to nurture. You know, a pastor can stay with a church for years. The same people seeing their faces every Sunday for 20 years, 10 years. The same people. But he will not get bored. But an evangelist will have to see different faces. So today he's here preaching here. Then tomorrow he's preaching here. The next day he's here. Different faces different environment. That's the spiritual version of what I'm saying. But there are people also who, who uh, for instance, the apostolic ministry, for instance, is a combination of the pastoral and the evangelistic. So apostles can, can start churches, nurture people, teach them, raise them, and they can also move from place to place at the same time. But if, that's what I'm saying. If you are a core, if you are a typical evangelist, you will be you'll be bored easily with church. The, every day you come, you you will see the same faces. You see that this one, this, this where he sits, this where he sits, this where he sits. Every day, the evangelist will not they, they, they can't handle that. Now, those who are pioneers. They are soon ready to move on to new territories to, to see hardship and difficulties to conquer them. And sometimes they also become impatient with settlers. You see, one day Bishop Doug was saying something which was very instructive. He said that when the grace of an evangelist came on him, it, 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 it disrupted his pastoral uh, duties. There are times he will come to the church and he will be angry. One day he went to the church and he drove all of them away. Go ahead, go and bring people, go and win souls. And realize that it was not helping the church because his evangelistic nature, if you like, was, um, was conflicting with his pastoral. And he had to leave the church. 
to appoint a pastor so that he can devote himself to evangelism. That's how come he, he went to start uh, this uh, uh, healing Jesus campaign. <laughs> healing Jesus campaign. And then he left the, the pastor of the church to, I think, Richard Shosaki or so. That's what happened. So he said one day he came to church and was angry. He said, go and win, so go. Everybody go. Move. That's an evangelist. Okay. Am I a leader or a follower? Which one? You must also know. Now, the last segment, nature. Both nature and nature must work together to accomplish divine purposes. So nature is like the building, while nature is like the scaffolds. The scaffolds are there to ensure that the building process is smooth. So nature is the scaffold, nature is the building. That's what God is building, but the nature is a scaffold. So, the system that God designed to enhance nature, they also border on nature. For instance, the family system, spiritual family and natural family, they were created to enhance nature. Enhance nature. The natural family and then the spiritual family because the natural family failed. And so the spiritual family was established. That's the church. And so it doesn't matter your environment. Once you step into the church, there should be a way that God will be able to correct the defects of your of your environment, the negative effects of your environment on your life so that the nature can be enhanced and deployed. So what you didn't get through the right tradition, the right association, the right uh, education, the right events, you can make a choice, have an encounter with Jesus, they make a choice, come and enter the church, and through the system of discipleship, it's supposed to affect and enhance your nature to be able to deploy your nature. That's why people discover their callings in church, their purpose in the Lord. That's why the church should be a place where the mind, the major, the major work of church is mind, mental transformation. Let me tell you something. You see, the major duty of the church is mental transformation. What I, what I mean by that is mind renewal. And spiritual growth, spiritual growth is a function of mind renewal. When we say somebody is mature spiritually, we are talking about how the soul has been transformed. How the mind has been renewed, the heart has been renewed to accommodate the spirit which has been recreated. That is spiritual growth. That's why the indices for spiritual growth are growth in character, growth in faith, growth in discernment, discernment, growth in love, and then growth in understanding and grace. These are the indices of spiritual maturity. So when a person is growing spiritually, it means that his mind is being transformed. His heart has been uh, affected. His mind is being renewed. And it's reflecting in his uh, actions, attitudes, relationships. That is spiritual maturity. Because you know a person's level of maturity by the decisions he makes, his choices, and his judgment of things, 
That's how you see maturity. You see, for instance, the Bible says even a child is known by his actions. When you have talking with children, it won't be long, and then they will betray themselves. When as soon as they speak, you will know that oh, this is a child speaking. Because you will know that what he's saying is in the real world, it's not it's not like that. He's being over simplistic, or he's he's just assuming too much. He's taking many things for granted because he's a child. When an adult is speaking, you will know from his speech that this one is an adult because if you look at the way he's talking, it's like he, he has taken certain things into consideration. Like I always say, um, you know my children by, uh, by three things, three main things. You know a child. Number one, they don't recognize boundaries. When you see people who don't have boundaries, they are children, boundaries in speech, boundaries in action. If a child comes here right now and you interview the child, chances are that whatever goes on in the house, he will say. If you want to know what happens in her house, put the thermometer in the mouth of the child. You will know the heat, the temperature of the house in the mouth of any child in the house. Because the children, they will say what they, what they see. They can't pretend. They, you see, adults, we, we can pretend. An adult, you can choose not to say something. Because you are an adult, you know the repercussions. But a child has no boundaries as far as speech is concerned. Anything he will say, he will, whatever he sees, he will just say, that's a child. Then also, you, you notice that children don't have a sense of timing. They don't have. Adults have a sense of timing. Children, they only stop playing when they are tired. If you leave them, they can stay out till 12 midnight for as long as they have energy to run around. They don't, they don't know that it's dark. Let's go home. They don't know. They are, they are fooled by their energies. But an adult will say, hey, Adiasa, it's night. Tomorrow I'll go to work. So let me go to bed. That's an adult. You see, he has a sense of timing. Number three, sense of responsibility. Children don't have a sense of responsibility. They only know privileges. And, but when, as you grow, responsibilities go with privileges, or let me say privileges go with responsibilities. So as an adult, you will know your privileges and then you will know your responsibility. So you see that spiritually speaking, it's the same thing. The more you mature in the Lord, the more you have boundaries. You have boundaries in anything, your speech, your conduct, your... Uh, I mean, how you handle yourself. Number two, the more you have a sense of timing as a mature believer, you know what time it is. There's a time for everything. You're not confused as to what time, what time you are supposed to do what as a mature believer. Then you have a sense of responsibility. That's why when people are growing, now they begin to uh, take up tasks in a church as a sign that they are thinking about they are thinking about the kingdom. There's a sign. It's a ministry is supposed to be an overflow of your maturity, your work with God. As you are growing, you have a sense of responsibility. Maybe you were a child, you were going to school. All that you knew was that every day you come for school fees. You didn't know that the work the store that your mother was managing small, small was the one that was paying your school fees. You didn't know. So you, you would just come for school fees. But you see, as you grow, when you come for vacations, you will see you go and help your mother in the shop. Why? Because now you are growing. Now you are beginning to link your school fees with activity of the shop. That is the same thing spiritually. There are people 
who will come to church, they don't know how things work. They don't know how, all they know is that when they come, things work. But as they grow in leadership, they are not just going to know how things work. They are now going to be part of those who make things work. And that's growth. So the church family was established to enhance nature. What you did not get in the family, the family setting, because you can never get perfection in any human institution. You see, for instance, you can never get all the love you needed from your family. You can never get. You can never get all the training you needed from your family, from your parent. You can never get all the attention you wanted from your parent or from your family. You can never get all the correction you needed. But you see, God has made provision for the church to salvage what the family system could not adequately provide. That's why you don't have any excuse to use your family background as a limitation. Anytime you, 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 you say things like, that's how I was raised. Or oh, as for me, that's how I was raised. Don't mind me, that's how I am. That's how I was raised. It means you are not serious. It means that you are not, you are not cooperating with the Holy Spirit because God has made adequate provision in the system called church to salvage what you lost or you didn't get through the family system, you get, you get it better through the church system. But the problem is that when we don't understand why church is in place and then we turn the church into a place of entertainment and a place where we come to compound people's problems, that the person is coming from the family system which has failed, running to the church, to receive discipleship and correction of mindset. But when it comes, then we are perpetuating that same thing. You know, though people in the church are not perfect, I'm talking about the spiritual investment that God has made in the system called church. Do you know that even Christian fellowship by meeting with believers there are many things that if you will take time to listen to God's word and to really go through, there are many issues of your life you will know how to deal with them. But the issue is that people always love to give excuses. There is no excuse. Listen, no matter what happened to you in your life, the events and circumstances. Listen, I, I, I wrote in my first book, I said that. Uh, understanding your appointment with destiny. That was the first book I wrote. And I wrote a statement. I said, you may not have an earthly father. You may not even know your father. But you can get a father in a church. And that single statement, it ministers so powerfully to one person who looked for me. Because of that statement, he later became my son. That one statement. You see, so and it's very true. You don't have any excuse. You don't. You don't need to be a product or a continuation of the failures in your family. The fact that in your family you are the only person who is born again is no excuse for you to fail, because enough provision has been made in the church. Now you can come from a dysfunctional family. That's no problem at all. The problem is. If you also continue that expansion in your family, then there's a problem. Then it means you just pass through the church. The church didn't pass through you. Are you getting me? You could have grown up witnessing marriage as uh, Tom and Jerry and cats and dogs. Now, that is not your problem. It's not your fault, and it shouldn't be your problem. What is going to be your fault is when you repeat that in your marriage then it will mean that coming to church was a waste of time. That you just passed through the church. It didn't pass through you. But genuine, genuine church or genuine church life is discipleship. Discipleship. We come here to learn wisdom 
not just wisdom in knowing the doctrines, but wisdom in ordering our lives. You see, one thing I've discovered is that many believers, uh, they don't, many believers don't have time for the word of God. It's a real problem. Time for the word is a problem. They don't have time for the word. I know what, how the word has transformed my life. I, I, I can give you first-hand, first-hand experience of transformation that comes through the word. Whatever you are dealing with, whether it is inferiority complex, whether it is the mindset that nothing good will come to you, whether it's a, de a depraved mindset, whether it's a defective mindset, a deformed mindset, if you take time to, to, to soak the word, you will change, your mindset will change. So nature, nature, defect in nature is not an excuse. Recently, I was thinking about Joyce Mayer. If I were discussing him here with somebody, and then we were saying that there's so much power in, in the Lord, in the church, in the word. So much power. If you, if you know Joyce Mayer's story, how she was sexually abused by her own father and her cousins, and how she grew up with a deformed mindset, suicide, depression, uh, sarcasm, anger, resentment, and all those things, a bundle of, I mean, she was an emotional wreck. And then she met the Lord encounter. When she met the Lord, it didn't, I mean, it, it took some time. It took some time for her to even stop smoking. It took some time. But you know what? She was dogged. She held on tenaciously to the Lord through all the failures and all. You get her books and read. You, I mean, you, you know her story. And then she also encountered one man who is her husband. And the husband was used by God to really, really help her, stabilize her. I mean, he gave her tough love because that's what she needed. If she had met somebody who would just be sentimental, it would have helped her. So encounters are very important. An encounter can veto all the negatives in your background. One encounter. One encounter with the word, with the body, with a person, with the Lord, will, can veto all your negatives. It may take time, but that encounter, giving chance, will surely, surely, will surely, surely overcome all your negatives. There are many people, you, you see, you may not, you may not, you may not be, uh, you see, you may not have gotten many things from the natural family, like maybe Isaac, got from Abraham or Samuel got from uh, Hannah and Elkanah or Moses got from all that. Do you know that it was Moses' mother who raised him for Pharaoh's daughter? And do you know that? And what do you think the woman put into the sun? That made him go, go and look for his, his brethren. When he was 40 years, it came into his heart to go and this is very when the mother had that short time with him, the mother put something in him. He kept on raising his ears. Look, you are a Hebrew, you're not an Egyptian. And as she was breastfeeding her, she was maybe speaking into her life. Because when he was born, she discovered that he was a goodly, ch a proper child, according to Hebrews 11 uh, 20, 23 or so. And then so they raised him like that. So, encounters are very important. Encounters are very important. Encounters, they are the game changer. Game changer. 
one, one, one encounter can change the direction of your life. One encounter. But we are not, we don't give the word a chance in our lives. We don't give the word a chance. We don't have time for the word. Today's believers, we don't have time for the word. We don't, we don't, we don't have capacity to, to, to continue in the word, to follow the word and allow the word to change our mind. That is the problem we are having as believers. It's not that our problem is not the, the family background that is limiting us. Those things, they are, they can be limitation. But if the word transforms our thinking, it can veto every limitation. Every limitation. So, encounters will give birth to convictions. Convictions. When you have an encounter, the result will be a conviction. Let's say now, yesterday in the in the evening, when you slept, you had a dream, and then you saw heaven, or you saw Jesus, or you saw something like that. You see that that encounter will give birth to a conviction. You will know that these things we are talking about, they are real, they are not just stories. And convictions will also give birth to actions. And that is the definition of faith. So faith is the action that you take in accordance with the convictions you have gotten from encounters with light. That is faith. Faith is the actions you take in accordance with the convictions you have gotten from encounters with light. Now we understand why the Bible says the weapon that overcomes the world is faith. Our faith, your faith. Because your convictions will overcome the world. Your convictions. And convictions are very important. We understand why, why Abraham left his father's house. Conviction that was born out of an encounter. For God had said, leave your father's house. He had an encounter. We understand why Noah endured many years of ridicule. Noah, conviction. God said it's going to rain. He, he had not seen the rain, but he moved with fear. Action based on a conviction that was born out of an encounter. Now we understand why Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Hebrews 11, 25, conviction. That's why in Hebrews 11, by faith, Moses, when he was of age, refused to be called the son of first daughter. You can replace the word by faith with by convictions born out of encounter, by actions born out of convictions, born out of encounters. Moses refused. He used his faith to refuse. Imagine what that would mean to Pharaoh's daughter. Just imagine, if you were a fairy daughter, how would you feel? Imagine the emotional, um, the emotional torture and the emotional blackmail that this woman will use on Moses. I took you out of water. I, I raised you. And now you are saying you refuse to be called my son. But how was Moses able to overcome that? sympathy or gratitude or that that indebtedness conviction convictions are always stronger than association stronger than tradition stronger than education stronger than events and circumstances even stronger you see your, your, even your negative choices, you can correct them only when you have convictions, the encounters that will give you different convictions. You will see you can correct your negative choices and then make positive choices. Okay, so we'll end here today and then we'll continue next week. We'll look at the rest maybe spiritual giftings and all that. 
and I'll and then I'll give you the questionnaire when we finish so that you can it can help you. And this this thing I'm teaching, it's not it's not really only for ministry for marriage. For, in fact, this this topic that I treated, uh, the same topic is in, in the book that I'm writing on marriage. I want my house to be a home. I'm I'm putting together um, a counseling manual for the ministry, and it's based on a book I'm writing. And this topic, nature and nature, that I have written, that that is also in that book. And the same thing, you you know your 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 giftings, your personality, that of your your spouse to be, and you see how the two of you, you can work the marriage out. Okay, uh, if there are questions, we are it's exactly twelve. Uh, we will allow for like. 10 to 15 minutes of questions if there are any. So if you have questions, you can raise your hand. Let's see those who have questions. Raise your hand so that, okay. Okay, all right. Okay, so you can start, Karen. Okay. Okay, and please, I wanted to know if you can be in between an extrovert and an introvert. Can you be, you'll be okay when you're alone, but when you find yourself among people too, you can flow. Okay, yeah, it's, uh, actually, nobody is strictly one personality type. We are different blends. Uh, so it's possible to have a bit of this and a bit of that. Yeah, but there'll, there'll be one that is dominant. What? Ambi, Ambi vet. Okay, a, a mixture of an introvert. No, Ambi what? Say it into the microphone. Ambi. The last part. Ambivert, like introvert, extrovert. Okay, ambivert. Okay, so ambidextrous. You know, ambidextrous is where you can use both hands, left and right. So ambi, combination of the two. Okay, Am, ambivert. Yeah. Okay. Okay, um, Daddy, please, I want to ask um, with the questions. The, the passion. Passion, okay. Yeah. Are there some passion that are just there as you know? It's just a passion. It's not anything you are going to use for something because, for instance, uh, maybe I have a passion for football. I love to play football. I love to watch football. I like everything about football. I have a strong passion for football, you know. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. But maybe you find yourself in a situation where you can't really use it for anything, but you have the passion for it. See, sometimes, you know, can be creative about it, maybe if you were on the page and all those things. But um, is it just something that it could be there as a passion, but on financial Yeah. You see, uh, that, that passion you have for football doesn't necessarily mean that you know how to play football. And then also maybe you are gifted in football. But it's a passion. And, and there are some passions that are actually developed Okay, like over time, uh, maybe as you were growing, you were among people, your older siblings or your uncles who love sports, took you to watch matches and all that. You developed interest in football. Then your interest became, you became passionate about your interest. Okay, so it's a, it's a passion. But there's no real drive to really move into football to become a footballer because you don't have the skill or the gifting for that <laughs> so that that same person you have it can be channeled into other things and there's nothing wrong having a passion for football the only time it becomes wrong is when it clashes with something that is from god somebody was telling me that when he became converted he said that he had to literally intentionally stop football otherwise he knew that he, he will not last because he said that uh they used to go for money devotion and he said that 
uh, the football, he nearly backslid because of the football. Because it's like the time for morning devotion is a time that they have to go for training. And he said that he had to run away from football. He just stopped. He just stopped. So it's not it, it, this one was even the somebody who knew how to play. Yeah, so you can always uh, manage your passion so that they don't disturb what God wants to do in your life. Yes. Um, I say, your natural gift says can affect your lower themes. You said that can, I, can affect your the lower themes of God, like your destiny. God has higher themes and yeah. lesser themes. Yeah. So I was asking, let's maybe him is to be a man of God, but God's lesser theme for you is to become a doctor. From what you said, it looks like your natural giftings are mostly um, geared towards your um, gods and um, higher things for you. But I'm asking if your lower things like me becoming a doctor is also be affected by your natural giftings, maybe natural giftings that God gave you, can he also be affected by? Yes. Yeah, yes, your profession, profession, vocation, job, and all that can be affected by your natural giftings. Uh, so, like the person who there are, there are some people who are doctors because they uh, they were they were pushed into medicine. Others are doctors because naturally they are caregivers. There are some who are natural caregivers. Even they are now doctors. You know, you can you can you can go to a consulting room and you can see that this person is more than a doctor. The person is, I mean. He's a caregiver, not just a, a doctor. Uh -huh. And there are some that are also doing it as a profession. They have learned it. So your your natural disposition, your personality, your giftings, they can all feed into whatever you do. Whether God's higher purposes or lesser purposes, they can all feed into it. But she said something about those questions. I wanted to ask if passions are... I wanted to ask if um, passions are strictly God, but you also said that you also said that um, passions may be hard from interests. Yeah. Uh, and also, I want to ask if circumstances and experiences too can affect your passion. I want to use an example. I really love to teach. It's something that I do with kids. I can sacrifice my time to teach people. Yeah. But I realize that at a point in time. Um, people's attitude towards my efforts like, made me a little reluctant about teaching. But I saw some people are, do not, are not grateful. Some also, after teaching them, will make some comments that you never expected. So it affected my drive to teach people. And also about football. My dad really loves football to the extent that he named me after a footballer and even my brother too okay <laughs> yeah growing up my uncles my brothers they love football so i i began loving football and i could play very well but i saw that i was playing in a team when i was a kid someone got hurt the person got injured to a football so to a football match so from there it affected me so much that now no matter what you do me i'll never play football I won't even watch it now. Like you said, even if they play the match in my room, I may not watch because of that. <laughs> I want to ask, is it because of that experience or the passion is still there? Just that I have to revive it. Okay, yeah, it's a real passion, but uh, everybody has a way of responding to um, circumstances and uh, events. There are people who can, uh, if you have a domin a, a domineering or let me say, a dominant or domineering personality, for instance, you will see that um, 
people, <laughs> people will not be able to get you to switch or to tune off. But if you also have like a, a good nature or let's say understanding personality or there are people who easily recoil when they, 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 come, uh, they come against pressure. That is where it's coming from. It's not like the passion is not there, but it's like you 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 recoil when you come against pressure, or when you can, when people start talking about the things you do. Okay, for as long as it's not what God has called you to do per se, then that one it won't be a problem. But when it comes to the things that God has called you to do, then you should adopt a posture that whether people talk about you or not, you still do it. Whether they, they show gratitude or not, you still do it because that's what you have been called. Paul said, I'm a debtor. I'm a debtor. So, I mean, it doesn't matter. You are a debtor. You must just pay your debt. Uh, but it can affect other things, you know, other things. You can let go of good things in your life because you retreated, because people maybe attack or something. So the passion is that you see that any if you decide to bring your mind to it, you see the passion will still be there. Because it's built around interest. Passion is built around interest. And once the interest is still there, the passion can be can be brought back. Yes. Okay. Okay. Is that the last question? Okay, then. Yours will be the last question. Okay, Daddy. Um, in um, 2 Corinthians 5, 16, Paul said, um, for now we know no man after the flesh. And he even mentioned about Jesus, that they knew him in the flesh, but now no longer. So, um, and I, I believe these things that we are, like it has to do with some of these things that we are talking about. So, um, how, how do you explain that? That he's saying that, look, we don't know man after these things. So, I'm asking this question because I want to know if whenever you are making conclusions about people, do you have to factor some of these things we have learned today? Especially when it has to do with maybe ministry and all of that. Do you have to consider that... Uh, and you pay them the this is how the person is. And that's in the natural. And Paul is saying here that, look, we, we don't know any man after the flesh. So. Okay. Um, in, the, if, okay in the first place, St. Corinthians 5, 16, he was talking about Jesus. He was saying that we don't know him from an earthly point of view. Uh, for instance, we have known him as the son of Mary, the son of a carpenter, but now we don't know him as such. Your, 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 level of, your level of revelation of Jesus should not be limited to his birth, his uh, parentage, and all that. Uh, it should be, now you should know him as Lord of all. That is how, we, that's how you, you, you can relate with him. So that's what he was referring to. So the next verse, he said that uh, we, are, we are a new creation. We are, we are a new, 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 if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Yeah. But then he said, therefore, from now on, we regard no one yes. according to the flesh. According to the Before flesh. he talked about uh -huh. And then so he was comparing. And he said, even though we have, we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him that's no longer. So the point he was making was Christ. But you cannot say that you will disregard what people are in the flesh in dealing with people because you are not dealing with their spirits. You are dealing with their spirit, soul, body. And the state of their mind renew, renewal will, will translate into the things they do. That's why the Bible even says that we should not put novices in charge of leadership. Otherwise, the Bible will not say things like that because we don't know anybody after the flesh. So no matter who the person is, what the person is doing or what the person is carrying, or oh, just put him there, he's a new creation. But the Bible says that we should let this mind, which was in Christ, be in us. So our, our spiritual growth uh, is, is really very important. It has to be taken into consideration when we are dealing with people. 
then also we must also be able to know that people are not at the same level of growth at, as people. Everybody has a level of growth. That is, as a leader, that is one thing that should guide you when you are handling people. There are, there are some people that you know that this one, this is the level. There, there are certain things, for instance, uh, if you are a pastor or an elder and I, you maybe you are making a certain kind of mistake, I will rebuke you. I may not rebuke a newcomer or somebody who is now growing. I will, I will can carry the person and all that, but I will be more stern on maybe somebody who is expected to know better, okay? Because we are different maturity levels. So if you don't, if you don't, if you lump it all together, then you, it's going to create chaos. Uh, and then it's going to create, because we are not at the same level. You must, you must recognize that in your dealings with people. There, there are some people that you will know that if you, if you put this person at this position, uh, the person cannot handle it. Be, because that, that area demands some kind of maturity that maybe this person does not have. So if you put it there, it's going to create a problem. Okay, um, actually, Mia, I've been applying, I mean, Second Corinthians 5, 16 to my life, and it has been healthy in a sense that maybe when somebody is portraying some sort of uh, maybe a negative behavior and all of that, I choose not to focus on that because that will also um, give you a negative uh, response to that. So I'd rather focus that well. That's not who they really are. I rather want to. I don't regard them after the flesh. I have, and I mean, being influenced by Second Corinthians five sixteen. So, well, this thing this person is doing is very clear that he or she is being self-centered. I'm not going to focus on the portrayal of self-centeredness. I'm focusing on her spirit, the born again spirit that oh, she has or he has love, and he the person maybe over time will learn but if i have to regard that then that one it will not be healthy to me and i may respond to the person based on his or um, how the person is also relating with me yeah i mean but if you know you know a person's level of maturity it, it gives you the opportunity to help the person i mean we must not we must not um we must not overlook certain things uh in our dealing with people you can't you can't just say that oh uh, this person you, you put something that the person stole is oh he's a new creation in christ he's not he, 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 he does not steal if anyone be in christ jesus the next time you leave your things there fine if it's your thing then no problem let the person keep on stealing <laughs> but you see that you must know that this person this is the kind of thing so let, how can you help the person that's you are not using that knowledge to condemn the person or to conclude on the person by using that knowledge to help the person and even you it will help you to know how to even help the person because you must know how to help people there are some people that the way you help them is sometimes to remove your eye and let them face consequences it will strengthen them it will make them wiser there are some that the way you help them is that you carry them. You literally carry them. There are some that you help them by blocking, blocking them from doing things. It depends on the level of maturity and what lesson the person must learn. Yes. Okay, so last question. Okay, Daddy, I want to ask, is God going to hold us accountable for not using our every passion in the things of God? And the second one is, um, let's say you are a teacher, but you also have the passion of writing books, but you, you, are, like, you are comfortable with teaching and you have not even engaged writing books with the mindset of making money. For that one to... Is God going to also hold you accountable for not uh, using that passion to also fetch enough money for you? Okay, yeah. So it depends on 
um, the, your purpose and what God wants you to do. Uh, for instance, if you want to, you, uh, you, you can write books and then you are being called to write, then definitely you are going to be called to account for why you did not write. Because maybe it's part of your destiny ordination to write books that will benefit the body. And then you refuse to write. Uh, then also, you must also know that uh, there are people that is going to bless. Uh, but let's say that you are maybe you want to write a book on the subject you teach in school and that you feel reluctant to write it. That one, God is not going to hold you accountable, but it's you that you are limiting yourself. Because that will be an extra source of income to you, or maybe it can help sort out certain things or help you to even support the kingdom more and all that. So even that you are cutting that 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 thing off, and there's nothing wrong with with writing to sell. There's nothing wrong with that because you 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 sit down and then you write, you sit down and write, and then you use money to print. Yes, so you 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 must sell it. Okay. Then, online, online. Okay, let's take the online question. And. The, the first question is, please, let's say you have a passion to do something else, but there has been countless prophecies about something you don't have passion for. Example, you love to dance or sing, but whenever you are given a prophecy about writing, meanwhile, you don't even like reading or uh, think of writing. <laughs> and so, then, sorry, uh, can you repeat it? Okay. The person is saying that, <laughs> and let's say um, she she's saying that, and she has passion maybe to dance, okay. but always the prophecies that are coming is maybe she has to like be a writer. Okay. But she doesn't even like reading to talk of writing. Uh huh. And then the second um, question to you, okay. the person is saying that, um, how do you avoid the trait to recall into yourself if you are an introvert after being offended, even after forgiving the person who offended? Okay. So, um, the first question, he has a passion for something else, but the prophecy is about something else. But is the other thing also something that he has a passion for or he can learn, I mean, he can, it depends on what the prophecy is about. And what he has a passion for because let's say that let's say you have you have a passion for sports you want to enter uh, football or maybe politics and then the prophecy comes and says that god says i've called you to pastor a church and it's not like uh, just a prophecy but you 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 know god has called you to pastor a church then you must respond to the call of god if you can do the two together then you must let the other one go and focus on the call of God. Yes. Let's say a footballer, and the God say, now, I want you to go and pastor a church at Sefshi. But you also want to play football, this team and all that. It's incompatible. So that one, you forgo your passion, like Paul had to forgo his passion for the Jews and focus on the Gentiles. Because the call of God, the destiny of the nation is more important than the abilities and, and all that. Then the second question is, um, how can you deal with the issue of recoiling when there's an issue, even after you are forgiving the person? Okay, you know, uh, such, such will be the, the, the personality trait of maybe um, somebody who is an introvert or let's say a melancholic, some, somebody like that. They usually it takes long for them to bounce back, especially in the area of trust. Once you hurt their, you, you break their trust or hurt their feelings, they can forgive you but stay away from you. They can run away from you all the time and all that. It's not, it's not a really good thing. It can, you, can, you can be balanced. You see, the fact that somebody maybe did something against you does not mean that, or the fact that you are forgiving somebody will not mean that you should just go ahead and trust the person, okay? But you should not be having ill feelings. When, if, you, if you are forgiving the person, then when you remember 
it doesn't bring you pain. If it brings you pain, you have not forgiven the person. Because true forgiveness will remove the pain. I mean, when it, it, it ends, when it goes through the natural cycle of forgiveness, the last stage is that the pain will not be there. You are, that means it means you are completely healed. So if you are still, the pain is still there, you are not healed. Then also, the tendency to recoil after you are hurt, it could be due to other factors, including pride. Pride can also be one of the reasons why uh, you do that. There are people who quit trying when maybe they come up against opposition or they come up against maybe criticism or even rebuke and all that. They will just quit trying. It's, it's a form of pride, especially when it, you are dealing with the body of Christ. Let's say that you are supposed to do this and then you did it and there was a rebuke. And because of that, I won't even come near. I'm just, you are, it, it's, you, it's not nice. It's, not, it's going to inhibit your flow, how you flow in the things of God. So pray about it. He should, the person should pray about it. And then allow God to um, heal you and then expose yourself more to the word of God and then seek counseling. Because how to do it? For instance, if let's say you marry right now, it means that you're going to keep a record of wrongs. But the Bible says love does not keep a record of wrongs. So if your partner maybe does something against you, you're forgiving the person. Are you going to say that they are forgiving you as my wife or husband, I'm, I'm, I'm going to withdraw. It, it, it's not really, it's not, you are not forgiving the person. I get TV. Yes, the person gets me. You are not, you are forgiving the person. You are, you are rather brushing the thing under a carpet, sitting on it and thinking that you are forgiving. But that's not forgiveness. So the, the test of forgiveness is, is there pain? Is that you still have pain when you remember the situation? Then it means you have not forgiven the person. Okay. So let's pray. Father, we thank you. We give you praise. Thank you for today. We pray that even as we study these things, you will help us, Lord to know ourselves and to identify with what is natural and what is nature and also help us to cooperate with the Holy Spirit to sharpen our strength and to compensate for our areas of deficiency. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.